Rafu, this is Shay, and I am sitting in my house on my couch with Daniel Vitalis. This is a very exciting day over here on Lincoln Street. So just say hi, Daniel. Hi, Daniel. <laughs> and hi, Rafu, and everybody watching. So Daniel's in town right now because he's going to be doing a Monday Night Live tonight. It's the first Monday Night Live of the 2010 season, and his topic for tonight is shamanic nutrition. After having an opportunity to interview him for a few minutes on the phone on this topic, I could tell he was incredibly passionate about this topic, and I thought he might be able to just tell you a little bit about what that even means to him. So my first question is just shamanic nutrition or indigenous nutrition. What does that even mean? Okay, for 16 years of my life, that's a little more than half my life, I've been immersed really deeply in the raw food culture and in, I guess, the health food culture at large. The health food culture is often anything but the health food culture. A lot of us know that. We've kind of gone through the soy phase and the low fat phase and the high fat phase and the protein phases and all these different foods. And a lot of us find ourselves in the raw food movement. I spent a lot of time in that world. I spent a lot of time as a fruitarian. I did a lot of the green diets. I tried a lot of the alkaline diets. I tried the superfood diet. I approached raw food from many different directions. And the reason I did it was because it occurred to me that must be the most natural diet for human beings. I think a lot of us arrive at that idea. At some point, I started to realize that there were wild human beings on the planet that those were the, the people who didn't live inside houses. Those were the people who didn't have um, modern uh, machinery. Those are the people without electricity. Those are the native peoples <clears throat> here on this continent. We call them the Native Americans. If we go to British Columbia, we call them the First Nations people. If we talk about the people, um, say, in Australia, they're called the Aborigines. We talk about the tribal peoples of Africa. These are what I call the wild people. I say wild, not in a derogatory way, but I mean in a way that they weren't domesticated, nor had they domesticated their food supply. And they are the people we can look at to really find out what real human beings actually have eaten throughout history. What I realized was I spent a lot of time speculating, and I listened to a lot of people speculating, about what human beings naturally eat. And then I thought, wow, why don't I actually take a look at what natural people actually eat? And when I did, I started to um, arrive at some new conclusions. And those are conclusions that I'm kind of bringing in or filtering into the raw food community and actually into the whole health food world at large. So one of the things that you were talking about was we've gotten out of the habit of having a relationship with the foods that we're eating. And whether that's understanding that the carrot we eat isn't the carrot, how it started as a mm -hmm. carrot. It's come from Queen Anne's lace and what it was medicinally mm -hmm. used as. And broccoli and all these other examples of the hybridized versions we're eating now. But how can somebody like from the raw food community, maybe in, in a Midwestern state without a lot of resources around them really start to deepen or strengthen their relationship to the food they're eating? Wow, there's a lot of information embedded in that question. So, okay. <laughs> um, let's start at the beginning of what you said. A lot of people have no relationship to their food. A lot of people make a lot of judgment about other people's dietary choices. A lot of people talk about the suffering caused by other things that people are eating. There's a lot of mud slinging about other people's food. Even in our raw food community, we have people you know, the, the high fruit diet people battling against the high green diet people. Everybody's going back and forth talking about the superiority of their approach. And very few people are even aware that the foods they're eating are living creatures. And no matter what dietary approach you subscribe to, no matter who you are or what you eat, every day you subsist on the carcasses of living organisms that you consume to um, basically take on their life force and or the stored sunlight in their body. We call that calories. We live by eating living things. Very few people have relationship to those living things because those living things arrive at their supermarket or they arrive in a box or they arrive on the doorstep or in their P.O. box and very few people have ever actually met those organisms. I, th I think that's very strange. I, f I find it strange that I had met very little of the organisms that I was eating. Literally didn't know who broccoli was. If it sounds strange that I would refer to broccoli as a who instead of an it, remember broccoli is alive. It's a living thing. It's a life form. It's evolved on this planet or adapted to itself to this planet or was created for this planet, however you choose to see that. It's a living thing. You can get to know it. 
very few people are aware, to go deeper into what the question you asked, very few people are aware today of where their foods have even come from, i.e. broccoli does not grow outside, naturally. This is why it's such a labor to grow it organically. This is why traditionally it's sprayed with pesticide, because organisms in nature see broccoli as a foreign organism. It doesn't have an immune system to live on this planet, and so organisms come and try to remove it. And that's why if you want to grow it in a garden, you have to protect it, because it's not a natural thing. You don't have to um, go outside and put fences around your dandelions in your lawn. Actually, your dandelions do fine. Why don't they need pesticides to stay alive? It's just because they're natural organisms. Many people know the dandelions in their yard better than they know the food on their plate because they spend so much time trying to kill off the dandelions. So I'm, I'd like to introduce people back to their food. You live in Santa Rosa, which is actually where Luther Burbank is from. And Luther Burbank was a horticulturist in the last century, the beginning of the last century, who actually created many of the foods we eat from wild foods or from other hybrids. He actually created those foods. Very few people are aware that the foods that we call natural foods are very rarely natural foods. In fact, most of them are man-made hybrids. So the reason I'm calling what I'm doing shamanic nutrition or you call it indigenous nutrition, it's not really a diet that I'm talking about. It's a movement toward or backward toward or forward toward, however you choose to see this, towards foods that actually really come from the planet. The, f the more we eat foods that aren't from the earth, the more we start feeling like we're not from the earth. And it's a bit strange. We almost are living now like a species visiting this planet rather than one that's indigenous to it. So in effect, looking backwards is a way to move ourselves and our health forward. Mm, looking backward, at least we can look backward and find out Rather than make up stories about what human beings used to eat, did you know all human beings were once eating 80% fruit and 20% vegetables? Or did you know all, all, they, all they ate was greens or whatever? We, we have these stories about that we're making up from inside our domiciles, our domesticated houses, and inside of our, our supermarkets. We make up what we think people used to eat. And everybody's selecting the foods in the diet. All these different diets that exist out there are all based on hybrid foods. So none of them can be the right diet for people because they're all based on foods that have only existed a few hundred years. Well, I really like what you're saying, and I can also see that someone has to be ready for mm -hmm. this piece of information. Mm -hmm. um, there would have been a time I wouldn't have understood what you were saying. Right. And, and in that time, what I did understand was Sally Fallon telling me that it was Excellent. the time-saving devices that Excellent. were killing me. And so we Excellent. look at all foods and go back to more natural ways of preparing mm -hmm. the food. And now what you're saying is the next step up from the that. The next step. For me, mm -hmm. which is not only is it the time-saving devices, but the actual foods themselves may have been so changed from right. their original form. Right. So next step for someone like you. Yeah. It's next step for somebody who's been on a raw food diet for a while, as an example. Next step is you connect with the community in your area that does wild food walks or herb walks. Or start one. Or start one. <laughs> um, there's usually people where you are that do it. You can look in the, um, at the herbal community in your area. You can look at the primitive skills community in your area. And go on herb walks and actually start to meet the plants that are the ancestor plants of the plants in your supermarket. What you find out, like you mentioned before, is that Queen Anne's lace, the natural carrot, isn't much bigger than your pinky smells just like a carrot, it's not full of sugar, it's not bright orange, and there's very little food on it. That large, big orange carrot is a human hybrid, and it's not really a natural food. That doesn't make it a bad food, but it certainly doesn't take us closer to our natural diet. And I think what most of us realize after many years of pursuing nutrition is that the more we move back to what's really natural, the healthier we become. And the more vibrant, and the more intelligent, and the more beautiful, and the, the actually, as a species, the better we'll be able to live on this planet because human beings are actually losing their reproductive ability on the planet. It's one of the things not being talked about very much, but it's happening. Human beings are becoming sterilized, just one like Pottinger's four. cats. Yeah, pot Did you ever see that t-shirt, Pottinger's Humans? I saw that at, <laughs> first, at one of my first raw um, festivals in Portland in like 2000, oh, Pottinger's that's Humans. Oh, good. I would like that. So, Somebody so watching this, get me, the, get me the link for those. I want one of those. So we're running out of time, so if anybody wants to learn more about what you're talking about or to mm -hmm. contact you, they should go to... Go to my website, danielvitalis.com, and from that website, you'll be linked to the multitude of websites that I have. Um, detailing thing. I, I attack this this issue from many different angles and so I have many different websites. But you can find it all on my video blog, danielvitalis.com. 
Okay, and check out Monday Night Live events if you'd like to see his presentation from tonight's event. Thank you. Thank Bye. Thank you.